Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering UiPath Forward Americas 2019. Brought to you by UiPath. We're back in Las Vegas, UiPath Forward 3. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. Bobby Patrick is here, he's the CMO of UiPath. Welcome. Hi Dave. Good to see Great you. Great to be here. Wow. Great to have theCUBE yeah. here again, right? Oh, uh, theCUBE loves doing yeah. these hot shows like this. I mean, this is, you've said, Gartner has it's the fastest growing software segment. You've seen uh, the data that we share from ETR. Uh, you guys are off the chart in terms of net score. It's happening, I, I, hanging on to the rocket ship. How's it feel? Well, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's great you all have seen some of the growth along the way too, right? I mean, we, we had our first forward event less than two years ago. And you know, about 500 plus, plus non-UiPath uh, people. Then go a year later, it was Miami. That's where, you, that's where we launched yeah. the Cube, I think, was Miami. That's right, yep. And, uh, and that was a great event, but you know, that was more in the 13, 1400 range. This one's almost 3,000, and the most amazing part about it was we had 8% attrition from the registrations. Yeah, that's I've insane. never seen that. Oh, we're averaging 18% to 20% for all of our, all, most of our events worldwide, but 8%. The commitment is unbelievable. Even 18 to, to 20% yeah. is, is very good. I mean, normally you'll see 25 to sometimes as high as 50%. Yeah, um, right. It just underscores the, the heat. The well, heat I think what's also great, other stats that you might find interesting. So, um, over 50% of the attendees here are, exec, are senior executives. Like, for the first time, we actually had you know, C-level executives, CHROs and CIOs on stage, right? You can feel the interest level. Now, of course, we want RPA developers at events too, right? But this show really does speak, I think, to the bigger value propositions and the bigger business transformation opportunity from RPA. And I mean, to come so far where no one knew RPA two years ago, to the CIO of Morgan Stanley on stage this morning raving about it, that's, we've come a long way in two years. Well, and I saw a lot of the banks here hovering around, sort of, you know, <laughs> knocking on your door, right? So they, they know, they're like heat-seeking missiles. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> but the growth has been amazing. I mean, I think ARR in 2017 was, what, 25 million? Well, at this time, at the end, of 17, it was 43 and a half. 43 and 25 and in now October, you're at, so it's 12 times higher now. 12, 12X. 12X growth. Which is the fastest growing software company, I think, in ever. We know from one to 100 we were. We did that in 21 months, and, all the, and we had banks who, you know, now we're not really counting it anymore. And we're kind of, you know, now focused more on customer expansion, even though we hit 5,000 customers, which we, we started the year at 2,050-ish. We just crossed 5,000. I mean, so the number of customers is great, but there's no question this conference is focused on scaling, helping them grow uh, enterprise-wide with, with, with RPA. So I think our focus will begin to shift a bit, you know, to really customer expansion. Uh, and, and that's a lot of what this announcement, the, the product announcements were about. It's a lot of what the theme here is about. We had four dozen customers on, on stage. You know, the Ubers of the world, the Amazons of the world, it's all about how they've been scaling. So, that's the story now. Well, you know we do a lot of these events, and I, I go back to some of the, uh, when the Cube first started. Companies like Tableau, yes, uh, great. Splunk, great. ServiceNow, I mean these, and, and you, when you talk to customers, first of all, it's easy to get customers to come talk about yeah. RPA. Yeah. And they're, they're all saying the same thing. I mean, Jean Younger has said she's never been more excited in her career <laughs> from security benefit. But the thing is, Bobby, it's, I feel like they're, they're really just getting started. Yeah. Right? I mean, most of the use cases that you see are, again, automating mundane tasks. We had one, uh, which was, uh, I think, American Fidelity, which is a real really bringing in AI, right, right. but they're really just getting started. It's like one, two, three percent penetration. So, I, what are your thoughts on that to kind of land and expand, if you well, will? Well, I think, you know, look, last year we announced the vi our vision of a robot for every person. At that point, we had SNBC on stage and they were the one behind it and they are an amazing story. Now we have a dozen or so that are on stage talking about a robot for every person, like Singtel and, and others. And so, but that, that's, and that's a pretty, pretty, pretty bold vision. I think, look, I think it's important to look at it both ways. Um, the, there's huge goals in applying RPA to solve real problems. I, there's a big opportunity enterprise-wide, no question, and we've got that. But I, look, New York Foundling was on stage yesterday. Yeah. New York Foundling uh, is a 150-year-old uh, 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 charity in, in New York focused on child welfare. Started by three uh, sisters of charity. Uh, they you know, focus on infants, and, and anyway, it's an amazing firm. Just the passion that New York Foundling had on stage with Daniel yesterday was amazing. But, but th they flew here because for once they found a technology that actually makes a huge difference for them in, what, in their mission. So their first RPA operation was, they have 850 clinicians, 
uh, every week they spend four hours a week moving their contact, uh, 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 new contact data associated with new child, child uh, issues from system to system, to spreadsheet and paper to system, right? They use RPA and they now save 200,000 hours a year. But more importantly, those clinicians spend those four hours every week with children, not moving. I, so I'm still taken, I think Daniel had a bit of a tear in his eye hearing them talk about it on stage. Yep. But I'm still taken by, by, the, by the sheer massive opportunity for RPA in, in a particular, to solve some really amazing things. Now, on a mass scale, a company can drive you know, 10, 15, 20% productivity by every employee having a robot. Yes. Yes, that's true. On a mass scale, they can completely transform their business, you know, transform customer experience, transform the workplace on a mass scale. And that, that is, that's a C-level, should be a C-level goal and that's a big deal. But I love these stories that are very real um, and, and I think those are important to still, still Well, it's highlight. a great tech for good story. Look, tech is, you know, with the whole you know, Facebook stuff and the fake news got, got beat up. And Benioff had come out recently and say, hey, it's, it's not just about increasing the value to, to shareholders. Yeah, um, right. You know, it's about tech for good and doing other things, affecting uh, lifestyles, life, you know, changing. Uh, and, and Michael Dell is another one. Now, I've, I've, I've kind of said tongue in cheek, you know, show me the CEO misses his four quarters in a row and see if that holds up, but nonetheless, you yeah. love to see successful companies giving back. It seems to be it's part of your culture. Well, look, I've been part of hardware companies and I met you all through a few of them uh, and others. I, they have good, noble causes, but it was hard to really connect the dots. Yes, there's CPUs underneath a number of these things. But I think, judging by the emotional connection that these uh, uh, customers have on stage, right, and these are the Walmarts and, and Ubers and others of the world, judging by the, the employee and job satisfaction that they talk about, the benefits there, I, I just, I, my career, I have not seen that kind of real direct impact from, you know, from B2B software, for example, on the lives of people, both you know, every day at work, but also to solving, you know, to solving, you know, help accelerate human achievement, right, in so many amazing ways. We had the CEO of, of the UN uh, IT Shared Services Group on stage yesterday, and they have a real challenge with, with you know, with the growth of refugees worldwide, and the, he, he would express it, and they can't, can't keep up. They don't have the funding, which is, you know, with everybody and, and Trump and others trying to hold back money, but they have this massive charter for, of good, the only way they get there is through digital. The new CEO, uh, the new head of the UN is a technologist, he's an engineer. He came in and said, the way we solve this is with, is, with, is with technology. And they decided, they said on stage yesterday that RPA, and RPA you know, has a path to AI and, and the, greater, the greater new technologies, that's how they're going to do it. And it's just a, it's a really, it's, I think it's, it feels really great. You know, it's funny that one of the things we've been talking about this week is, is it, people might be somewhat surprised that there's so much headroom left for automation because they, well, 50 years of tech, haven't we automated everything that's to be automated? And Daniel put forth the premise last night that actually technology's created more process problems, right? you know, we know. more inefficiencies. So it's almost like tech has created this new problem. Can tech get us out of the problem? Well, it's interesting. You think about all the applications we use in our lives, right? Um, you know, although people do have it, you know, a Salesforce stack and sometimes an SAP. The reality is they have a mix of a bunch of systems. And then we add Slack to it and we add other tools and we add, you know, it, all, the tools alone have some great value, but from a process perspective of how we work every day, right? How a business user might work at a call center, they have to interact then. And the reality is they're often interacting with old systems too because moving them is not easy, right? So now you've got old systems, new systems, and, and really the only way to do that is to put a layer on top of these systems of engagement and these systems of record, right? A layer layer on top that's easy to actually build an application that, that goes between all of these different, these different uh, uh, applications, Outlook, Excel, legacy systems, uh, uh, and Salesforce.com, and, 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 so, and so on, and, and build an app that solves a real problem, have it have outcomes quickly, and this is why, Dave, we unveiled the vision here that we believe that automation is the application. And when you begin to think about, I can solve a problem now without requiring a bunch of IT engineers who already are maxed out, right? Uh, I can solve a problem that can directly impact the business user, directly impact customers, and I can do that on top of these old technologies by just dragging and dropping and using a designer tool like Studio or Studio X, and a business user can do that. That's, that's the game change here. I think what's amazing is when you go to talk to a CIO who says, I've been automating for 20 years, but, you know, I can't get the ROI. Once they realize this is different, 
the light bulb goes off, we call it the automation first mindset, a light bulb goes off and you realize, okay, this is a very different, whole different way of creating value um, for, for an organization. I mean, I think about how people, the way that people work today, you're constantly context switching, you're in different systems, like you said, Slack, you're getting text, and you want to be responsive, you want to be real time. I know Jeff Frick, who's the GM of the Cube, he's got two giant screens right. on his desk. I myself, I always have 15, 20 tabs open. People go, oh, you got so many tabs. I'm like, yeah, because I'm constantly context switching, pulling things out of email, going back and forth, and so, and, and so I'm starting to grok this notion of, of the automation is the app. At first I thought, okay, it's the killer app, <laughs> but, but it's, it's not about stitching things together with, through APIs, it's, it's really about bringing an automation perspective across the organization. We heard it from Pepsi yesterday. Yeah, right. Sort of the fabric, the automation fabric throughout the organization. Now that's aspirational for most companies today, but that really is the vision. Well, I think you had uh, Layla from Coca-Cola also on, right? Yeah. And her vi their vision there, that, and they actually took the CDO role, the CIO role, and put them together, and they're re realizing now that that transformation's driven you know, by this new way of thinking. Yeah, I, I think, you know, look, we introduced a whole set of new, new products and capabilities around scaling, around helping build these applications quicker. I, I think, you know, fast forward one year from now, you know, the vision we outlined will be very obvious. The way people interact with, you know, via UiPath to build applications to solve problems, the speed that they operate will be transformational. And, and so, you know, and you see this conference here, I mean, you walk around, I mean, you saw last year and the year before, well, you see the year before, but it's, it's a whole, the, the, the speed at which we're evolving here, I, I think it's unprecedented and, and so I want to talk a little bit about the market forecast. Craig LeClaire was awesome this morning. Yes. Uh, he really knows his stuff. Now last year, I saw some data from him that said the market by 2020 will be four billion. I said, no way. It's going to be much larger than that. It's going to be 10 billion by 2020. Yeah. I, the Dave Vellante, for, back a napkin, my old IDC day forecast. Now, what he, what he showed today, his data, it actually was 10 billion by 2020 because he was including services. the services, which right. is what I was including in my number as well. But the thing, which was so good for him. Now, but the only thing is he had this kind of linear growth, and that's not how these rocket ship markets grow. They're more like an Ogive or an S-curve. You're going to get some, some steep part. Now, so I'd love to see like a longer term forecast, because it feels like that's how this is going to evolve. Right now, it's like you've seeded the base, and you can just feel the momentum building, and then I would expect you're going to see massive, steep, sort of exponential growth, steeper than maybe you know, non-linear, because that's how these markets right. tend well, to behave. Well, this is also going to come from the expansion potential, right? None of our customers are more than 1% auto automated from an RPA perspective, so that shows you the massive opportunity. But back to the market site, uh, data size, I, Craig and I, uh, and the other analysts, we talk often about this, I think the TAM views are very low. And you'll look at our market share, let's just get real data out there, right? Our market share in 2017 was 5%. Let's use Craig's linear data for now. You know, our market share this year is over 20%. Our market share applying, and I don't want to give the exact numbers out, so we don't provide guidance anymore, is substantially, we're substantially gaining share. Now, I believe that's the reality of the market. I think because we know Blue Prism's numbers, we grow four times faster than them, than them every quarter. Automation Anywhere won't share their numbers, but you know, uh, I can make some guesses, but either way, I th you know, I think uh, we're gaining share on them significantly. I think, you know, Craig's not going to want us to be 50% of the market in two years. <laughs> he's just not, and, and so he's going to have to figure out how to how, how to think more broadly about about that market trend. He talked about it on stage today about how does he calculate the AI impact and the other pieces now, the process mining now that now that we are integrating process mining into RPA, right, a strategic component of that. How does that also evolve the market? So I think you have both the expansion in the product portfolio, which drives it, and then you have the fact that customers are going to add more automations at faster pace and more robots, and that's where the expansion really kicks in. And we often say, you know, look, as a, as a, as a, as a company that, uh, you know, one day will be public company, our ARR number is very important, and we do openly, transparently share that. Uh, but, you know, the other big metric will be, you know, dollar-based net expansion rate that shows really how customers are expanding. And I think that, I know what our number is, we haven't shared it yet, I know all the SaaS companies, the top 10, I can tell you, you know, we're higher than all of them. 
the market projections are low, and I think he knows it. Uh, well, the, 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 speaking of TAM, I mean, we, I saw this with, with ServiceNow. Now, ServiceNow, the core was IT. Right. So the, the ROI was not as obvious. With, with, with you guys, you're touching business process. And so, right. so, and David Floyer way, way back did an analysis of ServiceNow. He said, wow, the TAM is way, being way undercounted by everybody, the Wall Street analysts, Gardner. It feels like the same here, yeah. because there are so many adjacencies, and you, just, you talk to the customers, and you're seeing that the TAM could be enormous, much right. bigger than the, whatever, 16 billion that Daniel showed the other day. Daniel said, Daniel's, the guy's got balls. He said, well, that's 16 billion, that's UiPath <laughs> at, at this date. And you know, we laugh, but I'm, I'm like listening, saying, I wonder if he's serious, because this guy thinks big. I mean, yeah. uh, who would have thought that you'd be at this point by now, and you're just getting started. Well, I think, you know, one thing I think is, um, you know, we're, we're you know, we were a little bit kind of over, a little less humble when we talked about things like valuation over the last two years. We were really trying to pr show this market's real. You know, we want to now focus more on outcomes and things, get a little less from around those numbers, and I think that shows the evolution of a company's maturity um, that we, I think we're going through right now. Uh, you know, the outcomes of you know, Walmart on stage saying, you know, their first robot, that was, this was, this was two years ago, delivered 360,000 hours of capacity for them in, 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 in HR, right? That, you know, I think those, that's where we're going to be focused because the reality is if we can deliver these big outcomes, continue them, and, and we can go company-wide, deliver on a robot for every, 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 every person, then you know, the numbers follow along with it. Well, well we saw some M&A this week uh, as well, which again leads me to the, to the larger TAM because we had PD on um, uh, yeah. with Rudy, and you can start to see how, okay, now we're going to act actually move into that, that vision that the guy from PepsiCo laid out, this, this fabric, of, of this automation fabric across right. the organization. So M&A is, is a part of that as well. That starts to open up new TAM opportunities. It does, and I think you know, uh, process mining is a great example of a market that is pretty well known in Europe, not so much in the U.S., um, and there are really only a few players in that, in that market today. Look, we're going to do what we did in, in RPA. We're going to do the same thing in process mining. We're going to do the same thing we're doing in IT, and that is democratization. You know, our strategy will be to go mass market with these technologies, make it very easy for accessibility for every single person. In the case of process mining, every business analyst to be able to mine their processes for them. And, and ultimately that flows through to drive faster implementations and then faster, faster outcomes. I think you know, our approach, again, our approach to the business users, our approach to democratization, um, you know, it's very different than our competitors. A lot of these low code companies, I won't name a number because I've never partners here at our conference. You know, they're IT focused, their service is heavy, and, and you know, their growth rates, albeit okay, are 30% year over year. In this market, that shouldn't be the case at all. I mean, we're 200 plus year over year still, and we've got big numbers. And I, we have a whole different approach to the market. I don't think people have figured it out yet, Dave, exactly exactly the, the, the strategy behind, which is, which is when you have business users, subject matter experts, citizen developers that can access our technology and build automations quickly and deliver value quickly for their company, and you do that at mass scale, right? And then you will now allow with our apps for you know, end users, like in a call center, to engage with a robot as part of their daily operation. That, None of the other IT vendors who are all kind of conventional thinking, and, and it, that's not, our models are very different, which I think shows in our numbers and, and, and the growth rates. Yeah, well you bet on simplicity early on. In fact, when we you did. joined UiPath, you challenged me, you said have some of your Wikibon analysts go out I remember. and download our stuff, and then try to download the competitors, and then tell us you know, how easy it is. Well, we were able to download UiPath, we, we built some simple automations, we couldn't get a hold of the other, other, other company's product. We tried, yeah, I we were told we'll go to the reseller, or how much do you have to spend? And okay, so you bet on simplicity, which was interesting because Daniel last night kind of admitted, look, he thanked the audience. He said, thank you for taking a chance on us because frankly, a couple years ago, this wasn't fully baked. Right. And, and so, so I want to talk about, last, last topic is sure. sort of, one of the things uh, Craig talked about was consolidation, and I've been saying that all week. I said, this, this market's going to consolidate. You guys are the leader now. You've, you've got to get escape velocity because the leader, makes a lot of money and becomes, gets big. The number two does okay. 
Number three, man, everybody else, and the big guys are starting to jump in as well. You saw SAP, you know, makes an announcement. You guys are specialists. And so, your thoughts on hitting escape velocity. I, I wouldn't say you're quite there yet. I want to see more in the ecosystem. There's maybe, who knows, maybe there's an IPO coming. I predicted that there is. Um, but your thoughts on achieving escape velocity and some of the metrics around there, whether it's customer, adoption, penetration. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we definitely don't have a timetable on an IPO, but we have investors, public investors and VCs that at some point are going to want. This is the reality of how, of how it works, right? Um, I, you know, I, I, look, Dave, I don't think the, um, you know, I think the numbers to focus right now are on around you know customer outcomes. I think the ecosystem's a good one, right? You know, we have. All, I'd say the biggest ecosystem for us to date has been the SAP ecosystem. When we mm -hmm. look at our advisory board members sure. or others, that's really where where the action is. Supply chain management, ERP. Um, you know, certainly CRM and others. We don't have a view that some of our competitors have. Like we have chosen not to take money from our, from ecosystem companies because we don't. Our customers here are building process automation across ecosystems, right? So you know, we don't want to go bet on say just one, like Salesforce or or, or Workday. We want to help them across all of the ecosystems. Now, so I think it's a little bit of a different strategy there. Look, I think the interesting thing is the SAPs of the world. They bought a small company in France called Contexture. They're trying to do this themselves. Uh, Microsoft, you know. Microsoft and, and Mark Benioff and Salesforce are asked on every earnings call now, what are you doing for RPA? So they've got pressure. So maybe they invest in one of our competitors or maybe they you know, take Flow and Microsoft and yeah. expand it. I think they can't move fast enough because you know, I don't know if Microsoft has, I mean they're a great sponsor here by the way, so I don't want to be careful what, we, what I say, but you know, strategically speaking, these larger companies operate in 18 month, 12, 18, 24 month kind of planning cycles. If you did that, you'll never keep up with us. There's no one at any of our, at the traditional large enterprise software companies that ever would have bet that we would come out and say that the best way to build applications, right, to solve problems will be through RPA. And there will be a layer on top of all of their technologies that makes it easier than ever for business users to build applications to solve problems. That's going to scare them to death. Why? Because you don't have to move all your legacy systems anymore. Yes, you've got tons of databases, but guess what? Don't worry about them. Leave them alone. Stop spending money on, on, on a ridiculous upgrades, right? Now, just build the new layer. And I'm telling you, I, I, they're, as they figure this out, they're going to keep looking back and say, oh my God, why didn't we know, why didn't we know this? And look, I, hopefully we can all partner, we're going to try to go down that route, but there's something much bigger going on here and they haven't figured it out well, yet. Well, the SAP data is very interesting to me. And I'm starting to connect the dots. I just did a piece uh, on my breaking analysis, and yeah, SAP, very good. They, very good they, work. thank you, they, they've acquired 31 companies over the last you know, nine years, right. uh, and they've not bit the bullet on integration the way Oracle had to with Fusion, right. and so as a result, there's, there's, they say throw everything into HANA, into memory, that's not going to work from an integration standpoint. Right. Automation is actually a, a, a way to connect you know, the glue across all those disparate systems. Right. And so that makes a lot of sense that you're having success inside SAP and there's no reason that can't continue. Well, and there's a, you know, there's a number of, of major kind of trends we've outlined here. One of uh, we call human in the loop. And you know, today, you know, when, you, when an unattended robot can actually stop a process, and, and instead of sending the exception to a, an IT person who's monitoring, say, orchestrator, actually go to an inbox, a task inbox of that business user in a call center or wherever, and that robot can go do something else it, so it's efficient and productive. But once that human has solved that problem, right, that robot or a robot will take that back on and keep going. This human in the loop, human and robot interaction, um, it doesn't exist today. And we're, you know, we're rolling that out with our UI app apps. Uh, I think you know, that, that's kind of mind blowing. And then when you add a, I can't go too far into our roadmap and strategy here, when you add the app programming layer and you add data science, that's a little bit of a hint into where we're going uh, because we're open and transparent. Uh, our data science connection, it's, it's this platform here, this kind of, I like to still call it all RPA, I think that that's a good thing, but the reality is this platform, this TAM, this, what, what it can do is, Nothing like it was a year ago, and it won't be anything like where it is today a year from now. Well, you got the tiger by the tail, Bobby. <laughs> you, got, you got work to do, but congratulations on all the success. It's really thank been you, great to be able to document this and cover it, so thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you. All right, and thank you for watching, everybody. We're back with our next guest right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from UiPath Forward 3 from Bellagio in Vegas. Right back.